Hi everyone, I'm Mary, and today we're going to be checking out Biotech Lore and History, The Age of War. Now, we're going to be covering a whole bunch of things Sven Vanderplank has put out, but more importantly, we are going to get to the Dawn of the Mech, because that is something that's going to be in this playlist, and god damn, am I looking forward to that, because I really like this time period. It's as much as I love the ships, I love the mechs too, man. I know, giant stompy robots and giant stompy ships. Granted, if the ship is stomping on you, you're probably in Gurren in which case, neat. So I'm just going to jump in and enjoy this. What we're getting to all the way, I don't really know. Because I know absolutely nothing about this time period, which is why I'm watching this video. I know, crazy that. More importantly, there's a link below to the original video. Hit it up, and let's get started. Okay, so we're on the rise of House Stein. In the final nice. years of the 24th century, Robert Kurita took the reins of power from his deceased father and became the fourth coordinator of the Draconis Combine. Ooh. Already he had established a brutal reputation for himself, having murdered his sister's peasant lover, Werner von Rohrs, and so those around him prepared for the worst. Okay, so when you're being told as the brutal leader by Kurita standards, Damn. Now, I'm not sure if maybe they had a much kinder reputation by this point, but considering the previous parts of this video, I doubt that! You're going full on, I honestly, loud from the last time we did this, now that I think about it. Looking on enviously at the fighting going on in the Rimward area of the Inner Sphere, Robert Kirita began planning his own offensive against the Lyran Commonwealth. His plan Look. called for a feigned push to- Wait, 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 wait. He was looking at all those wars Lao was starting and losing, and was envious? I'm pretty sure the losing part didn't occur to him, so let's just ignore that. Towards the Lyran capital of Arcturus, along the Oi. border between the Federation of Sky and the Tamar Pact, where the defenses were weakest. But after yep. the Lyrans moved to defend their capital, the Kiritans would swing to the left and aim to meet a second push coming from the direction of the Terran hegemony, thereby isolating a large chunk of the Federation. Oh, so they're cutting it the off. The yeah. first phase of the campaign, beginning in January 2407, got off to a great start for the Draconis Combine. It wasn't until Morningside that the Lyran Commonwealth was able to muster enough of a defense to stop their advance. Hey, Takayad, nice. Worried I'm easily pleased. Worried that would cause the collapse of the Lyran administration, Alistair Marsden made the decision to move the capital to his homeworld of Tharkad, leaving the construction of this new government Tharkad. complex oh, really? to his new wife, Catherine Steiner. Meanwhile... Oh, okay, so that's how the House Steiner jumps in. I'm assuming... Her husband doesn't live very long. Lyran Intelligence had pinpointed the location of a major staging post on Vega. Recognizing the threat of a second wave, Marsden launched a preemptive raid in early 2408, oh. devastating the unprepared defenders. Wheeling back around to respond to calls for aid coming from Menkent, Alistair arrived to reinforce the beleaguered defenders on January 28th, where he took personal command of the 311th Sky Armor Cavalry. Morale was. Ooh. Cool logo. One of the people who does the art used in this video for the various logos got into my Discord, and frankly, the thought process they put behind everything is kind of fascinating to read. So, if you want an example of that, just link below to the Discord. Yeah, it's in the Battletech section. Yes, I, there's a Battletech section in my Discord. I'm pretty sure no one's surprised about that. And they actually went through their entire thought process, how they found the old examples and made up ones that kind of match to the best of their ability. It's actually really cool to read, so I'd check that out if I were you. I mean, I'm not, because that would be creepy. I would never do that. Joking aside, honestly, I had a great time reading it. You know, just shout out to them for doing it. Hi, and the fledgling Lyran armed forces seem to be finally coming together behind the Archon. Three days later, Alistair was killed during an attack. Called it! While the Lyran command reeled from this loss, Catherine quickly seized control of the Archon ship. She was able to free more forces by inviting the Terran hegemony to station its own troops on the jointly held worlds that they had negotiated with their neighbors, a practice the hegemony had employed in other areas of the Inner Sphere as well. Jointly held worlds. Huh. See, now this is actually really fascinating to me, not because that is weird that another nation would invite another enemy nation into their borders, or what they would perceive as their borders to just, hey, why don't you also occupy us willingly? But because it shows how the Star League could happen. Because if this is something the hegemony is doing to everyone, it's not just that they're a neutral arbiter, it's that they kind of already have a presence that people were getting used to and negotiating with in their own territory. So it makes that a little easier of a push rather than the hard no wall wall. It's we're kind of overlapping you already and we got all this stuff going on. Yeah. It does seem more like this is almost a prelude to what comes later. And considering the previous video ended on aspirations of Star League or something similar, whatever they would call it initially. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense that these kind of border worlds where they had joint jurisdictions would be a thing. I just, I never considered they would actually do that, though. That's really cool. Oh. On Leon, the HAF was able to repulse a Kirita attack, but this was the only confrontation between the two. Oh. Catherine was able to secure her seat of power by dispatching her major rivals to the front lines. In March, they were able to win a major victory at Meacham, but in due course, all would be counted among the list of casualties. Controversially, Catherine- Of course. I mean, that's not even a really new tactic to Biotech. Sending the people you don't want to live into places where they probably won't. I mean, you didn't have them killed, they just happened to catch enemy fire. And if some of them happen to need to be in multiple places at once to catch multiple bullets, I mean, that would just be bad luck. Catherine also reverted her name from Marsden back to Steiner, and her son Alistair would be known as Marsden Steiner. Oh. Robert Kirita's campaign was finally abandoned in 2409, but raids between the two nations continued, perpetuating the constant state of war developing across the inner sphere. An assassin's bullet to the head would spell the end for Robert Kirita in 2412, oh, really? with a coordinator ship huh. passing to his brother. His campaign had not made a single notable game for the Draconis Combine, and yet, unknown to himself at his time of death, he would perhaps make the single greatest impact on House Kirita of any individual since Shiro himself. First, he had unleashed House Steiner, mortal enemy of the Kiritans, onto the inner sphere. Second, after the birth of his nephew Nihongi von Rose, his prior actions would result in the near extinction of his house. Wait, what? Wait, House Kirita nearly went extinct again? Because I'm pretty sure they mentioned that they were kind of dying out prior to this as well. Oh, that sounds so weird. I'm just. I'm used to them being in so many places at once that there's always going to be a backup either buy more troops or just another cousin that could take over. It just, huh. Also, I, I do like the idea that because she took over specifically and established House Steiner from that, or what will become House Steiner because she's now in the Archon ship and I'm assuming she'll just keep it, and then her son will after that, that the establishing of the house was literally founded on Kurita being Kurita. So even if that's probably not the most damaging war they had, it's the one that had the traditional impact, which really sounds like a cool line, but by that logic, America and Britain should still be mortal enemies, so it, it can get very heavily blurred. On the other hand, curry time, man. With very few exceptions, uh, you know what you're getting. Granted, when those exceptions come up, usually the, you know what you're getting side is on Steiner, and I'm being told I should not look into it for sake of not wanting to punch something. I don't know why, and I don't want to find out. Ares In 2412, oh, right, a Free Worlds League invasion force landed on Tintervel with the intent of liberating the planet from its Liao occupiers. Uh, what transpired liberating. became known as the Tintervel Massacre, when unrestrained use of firepower led to the devastation of the civilian population and hundreds of thousands of casualties. The Capellan Chancellor, Alicia Liao, was so incensed by the violence that she was compelled to begin an initiative that would forever change the way wars were waged within the Inner Sphere, inviting the heads of government from each of the six major powers, as well as four minor ones, to a peace conference on Ares. Alicia laid out a proposal to severely restrict the use of WMDs, as well as strictly define where military engagements could take place and who could be targeted. I literally just caught that. I'm sorry, like, I already went through text covering this, so I have no excuse. They had a peace conference on the planet Ares. The name of the ancient war god Ares. I'm pretty sure Greek, too. Yeah, because it's Mars and Roman. So the Greek war god Ares. And they're having a peace conference on that. That is... Whoever came up with that in the Battletech lore, you are a massive troll, and I love that level of irony. That, that is... That's kind of amazing, man. Uh. The reception to these proposals was largely positive, but the reasons for the signatories giving their approval varied. Alicia herself wanted peace, but the Marshal Kuritans, for example, approved of the honourable new style of combat. Though some were sceptical, each member nation un <laughs> Honourable. <laughs> Considering their entire history was literally founded, as this is covered, by backstabbery and espionage bullshit, <laughs> honourable. That definitely seems more put on than it did before. Like, even more than the clans, now that I think about. ...understood the possibility that the others would unite against them if they refused to sign, and so yep. almost all did. 
Crucially though, two refused. The mistrustful Torians suspected a trick and withdrew from talks, but the United Hindu Collective declined for a different reason, suspecting that these articles could actually legitimise and legalise warfare as a means of settling disputes and thus lead to further conflict. Damn. I mean, that that is literally exactly what happened. I don't even think it was intentional because it sounds like Alicia Liao wanted actually what she said and wasn't trying to screw anyone over. Yeah, this time period's weird. The honorable up front not trying to stab you in the back Liao. Or the front. It just it I'm sorry, I'm used to Lao being the second mustache twirling evil assholes that compete for it with the Curitans. It it's weird to have one of their good guys come out. It, it just it feels weird. It's nice that they have it, but it feels weird. Huh. History would show that to be an incredible display of foresight on yeah. their part. The Ares Convention is lauded as one of the great documents of human history, but their significance is often overstated. Though they did result in a gradual shift away from more destructive methods of fighting, a closer look at the content of the articles reveals just how toothless the documents actually are. First of all, no reprimands or penalties are defined by the conventions at all, giving the signatories no basis for action should one of the rivals resort to the use of WMDs or civilian casualties. Wait. So it's literally, it's useless. I, because of how much impact it had and how people would always say, well, do do the Ares Convention. And I'm sitting there going like, wait, there's no enforcement mechanism. It's literally useless. And I don't mean that in the figurative or, oh, and by terms of history. No, by history standards, people hold it up. But if there's no enforcement mechanism, it is literally useless. I can only say that so many times before it becomes old. And considering that this is set so far back in the Biotech history, it is also literally old by this point, so I think that's not needed anymore. But <laughs> there is no reason to pay attention to it other than fear other people might gang up on you by using nukes. But that wouldn't matter because they were already using nukes and ganging up on each other at this point. Frankly, the, th this right here actually kind of solidifies this point right now as the most unrealistic. Because everything else you can kind of roll with in Battletech. The Ares Convention, if anything, this is probably the one time they need to retcon or find out that there was actually a secret pact to enforce it if anyone went too far. Because that's the kind of little bit of information that does really change interpretations. If there's no downside to doing it, you just do it and don't care because who's going to do shit? No one. And it's not like unrestrained warfare wasn't happening prior to that. It's just they were doing it selectively. <sighs> Sorry, that is actually something that is a massive plot issue. That That's actually a problem. I'm not even going to make a joke here. This is a legitimate problem to the setting because if there's no enforcement, it's literally useless. It's like saying, well, the United Nations stops war. Uh-huh. Uh. During an attack. The only repercussion then could be the retaliatory use of such tactics by the offended party. But they were already the willing to do that themselves. prior. This was more or less the state of affairs before the Ares Convention, where the concept of mutually assured destruction the fact that everyone acted as a weird. deterrent to the use of WMDs. Furthermore, the conventions only govern the use of unconscionable tactics between signatories, leaving several major loopholes. Firstly, nations who did not sign left themselves vulnerable, as the Torian Concordat would soon discover. But did they? Did they really? Because everyone was still vulnerable. If anything, this thing would absolutely, in practicality, be treated as the, oh, Okay, so we're just saying we're not using nukes, but we need to be ready for someone ignoring it because there's literally no downside. Peer pressure doesn't matter when you're already willing to nuke each other. Pirates were expressly permitted as fair game, and so not surprisingly, the definition of pirates expanded wildly after the <laughs> signing, and so-called pirates appeared up and down all the borders. 
Lastly, Shocking. internal conflicts were not covered by the restrictions, and so civilians would continue to suffer during times of civil war. Also, I wouldn't be surprised if for any reason you just happened to decide that the pirates, who you definitely were sponsoring, were on your enemy's planet, that you definitely had no option but to nuke because the pirates took over the planet by being on it. If that didn't happen, I would be very surprised. Another problem with the Ares Conventions was that despite being tabled in 2412, they wouldn't come into effect for some time afterwards. For example, the Federated Sons representative at the meeting was Simon Davian, the so-called twin tyrants who were the presidents of the Federated Sun in the early 25th century, oh. did not acknowledge his decision to sign, and so it wasn't until Simon came to power some years later that the Federated Sons officially adopted them. Oh, so they Other weren't even a too, had their own delays. In ah. practical terms then, the Ares Conventions were hampered by a number of problems, and this is best demonstrated by the fact that over the next century, each of the signatory nations would make use of WMDs when convenient. The problem Huh. Shocking. Sorry, I'm just thinking back to all the times the comments on you are like, well, they would never actually do weapons of mass destruction because of the Ares Convention. I'm just sitting here going, bullshit. And apparently I'm right. The problem was serious enough that the Capellan Confederation and Federated the Sons sucks. signed oh, their own pact on leave, prohibiting the use of nuclear arms against each other. However, despite its flaws in imposing limitations on the use of WMDs and restricting civilian targets, ultimately the conventions would lead to a reduction in the number of casualties. Because even putting on the act of disarming, which apparently was just an act for them, did reduce the number of usages, so it technically worked. Even if it was just for appearance's sake. Still kind of surprised I haven't made any actual rules about dropping rocks though. I know there's a bunch of people who are listening to me who have heard me talk about that a lot on the text videos. They were going like, oh god damn, he's talking about rocks again. And I'm going to stand by that because, frankly, if you can abuse orbital mechanics to get enough velocity and just start a chain reaction of dominoes hitting rock after rock, you have to have a really good mapping of what is in orbit in a solar system. But if you have that, yeah, that's a really good way to use minimal effort for maximum fuck you. I mean, you could also just put a rock in orbit and then drop it, but that's kind of a waste of energy at that point. Um, orbital mechanics are bullshit, man, when you really have a good idea of how big things are. And if you do multiple things at once, unpowered dark objects that don't put off any heat or energy or electromagnetic radiation are really hard to detect. And I don't think the scanning technology in Battletech is so good that they could perfectly map things up like that. I could be wrong, and if I am, that, that's actually really cool. But yeah, no, dropping rocks due to abusive orbital mechanics is very much something I'm surprised they haven't done more of. If only because I don't think that was really thought about when this was being set up as a setting. Hmm. Now, there's actually a lot of places that don't really talk about how you do that. Unfortunately, the conventions would result in an increase in the number of engagements fought between nations. Strategically insignificant sized units Ooh, suddenly had the ability to contest board. worlds within the framework outlined by the Ares Conventions. Even in defeat, they could withdraw to argue the- Wait, they're highlight. Is this from an actual tabletop game and I just missed it? It's like a heavily stylized filter? No, it has that drawn effect. Where the hell did he get this image and where can I find it? Issue again another day. Therefore, fighting increased, but the strategic gains and accomplishments decreased. Border worlds became a seesaw of back and forth, with rulers changing on a yearly or even monthly basis. Despite being lauded as bringing about the idea of civilized warfare, if anything, the Ares Conventions proliferated the idea of war as a means to an end. One final Which, amendment I mean, was added was, to the so. conventions in the late 26th century. It is an amendment that is too often overlooked and forgotten about. In 2579, oh? shortly after the creation of the Star League, all six member states unanimously voted to rescind the Ares Conventions in their entirety. Yep. Paving the way for the atrocities of the reunification war. Although, let's be completely fair here. Would that have actually stopped anything if they hadn't rescinded it? No. No, no, it wouldn't. Because none of the people being reunified were part of the signing coalition. Actually, no, wait, no, the Rimworld Republic actually was. Huh. Okay, so... Maybe it actually would have had some effect, if only on paper, and that paper would be useless because the entire document was literally just for show. 
the Rim In 2412, oh, the various neat. nations of the Inner Sphere came together to sign the Ares Conventions. The set of rules outlawed the use of WMDs and restricted who could be fired upon during an engagement, Outlawed. as well as where those engagements could take place. It's ironic that the nation whose initiative had spawned the Ares Conventions was also the first nation to break them. I'm going Alicia with Alicia died. passed away in 2015 and was replaced by Arden Baxter. Baxter spent his time in power doing two things. The first was curtailing the Liao family's influence. The second was beginning the Rim War against the Torian Concordat in 2014. Wait. This is another example of the actual Liao family in this area of space being a good influence. Because the guy who tried to reduce their influence showed they really fucked up. And by they, I mean the person doing it, Baxter. Huh. Are, are Laos secretly the good guys who just went through a multiple century long corruption arc? I don't know. This feels weird. 418. The next four years of fighting would see some of the most brutal of the entire Age of War. Since the Concordat was not a signatory of the Ares Conventions, Baxter proclaimed that his forces did not have to abide by them either. Nuclear attacks and worse were frequently deployed against the Torians, who retaliated with their own arsenal of WMDs. Yeah. By the war's end, only three planets had been won by the Capellans. And, and were they really even planets at that point? Wastelands. Tension was mounting between the Free Worlds League and Lyran Commonwealth during this period as well, with several planets falling to the latter. Fresh on the heels of his victory over the Capellans during the Angerian War, Peter Maddock was again chosen as Captain General, and in 2416 was dispatched to retake the Lost Worlds. Their main objective was to dislodge the Lyran occupation force on Judone. During this time, Peter Maddock That's was you hamstrung by the interference of his own government. Oh, wow. Eventually, Parliament was even able to install an oversight committee to control his actions. Despite this, he was able to succeed in his counterattack against the Commonwealth, and even pushed ahead with an ill-advised attack on Rochelle in 2418. By oh, taking this planet, Solaris so is. crucial huh. to the Federation of Sky economy, he had effectively ensured that long-term peace was an impossibility. When the Lyrans inevitably launched another invasion just two years later, he had become so tired of the backroom government deals that he refused the role of Captain General outright. In their desperation, Parliament turned to a member of House Stuart, the second and last time a non manic would hold the post, but the results were less than stellar. By 2427, the Lyrans had continued to push Rimward, and even a major counterattack in 32 failed to recover the Lost Worlds. That is a significant portion of space, considering most of the time we've seen things being taken over in the last, well, I think the last hundred years, the swings have been significantly smaller. So this is a major push now that the houses are more established. How badly... Okay, I should never mind. I know exactly how badly this guy did. He is... Basically proving why Merrick is the house now. Because everyone else fucked it up. Worse. It would fall to a second Peter Merrick to reverse their fortunes. By now, the situation was dire enough that he was able to force the League Parliament to rescind the restrictions they placed on the Captain General, giving him access to the funds he needed and the flexibility I'm sure to act never come back to them. His audacious plan called for a deep thrust towards the capital of the Lyran Commonwealth, Tharkad. Oh. Beginning in 2441, he began his advance, and within five years was almost within striking distance of the capital. Knowing how isolated his position was on the salient he had created within the Lyran Commonwealth, and how vulnerable his supply lines were behind him, he smartly sued for peace. The captured worlds would, unsurprisingly, return to Steinigan. Again. Oh, he literally got to the point of, give us what we want, or we just say fuck it and nuke you. But of course he doesn't say the nuke part, because... <laughs> That would be heavily implied by how weak the Ares Convention was. I, I mean, it makes sense, but at the same time... Yeah... ...control in time, but Merrick now had the time to strengthen his defense as well as his family's position within government. Which is probably what he really is Seeking going for. to settle the dispute once and for all, the latest Captain General, Gerog Maddock, launched yet another assault in 2455. Beginning on the world of Alula Borealis and then forcing the Lyrans off Bella the following year, Gerog established a brutal reputation for himself, using strategies that made a mockery of the Ares Conventions. Such was the perception- Huh. Wow. Someone doing that. I am shocked. ...of him among the Lyrans that they took to calling him the Bloodthirsty Giant. 
But later that year, he launched an invasion of Lorik, where the fighting was as fierce as ever. Steiner was not prepared to let the planet go, and the invasion bogged down, drawing on for another three years. By 2459, Gerok was preparing to make yet another strike against the remaining Lyran-held continent. As he moved his regiments into position though, he spotted a dozen great silhouettes on the horizon. Confident of his numerical superiority, Gerok pressed ahead. <laughs> so this is sorry as far as first time seeing a mech go just seeing a silhouette in the background and thinking ah we got the troops this is going to be shock and awe from the troop side isn't it uh, this is sorry i've actually been waiting for a moment like this straight into the jaws of death a blizzard of fire met them on approach, and soon the entire line was collapsing. The Free Worlds League had just stumbled into the first deployment of Lyran battle mechs in history, first. and immediately paid the price. Only a single mech was taken out of action at the cost of dozens of Marikama. Undeterred, Gerol ordered his reserves into the fray. Reports differ on his state of mind during this final moment. Had he gone mad, or was he determined to make a heroic last stand against the Lyran? Considering what they said, he's probably just thinking, eh, we got the troops. They got enough bullets, one of them will win. Juggernauts. Either way, there was nothing heroic about Gerok's demise, crushed underfoot by this new mechanical monstrosity. Okay, so we're going with the absolute giant size interpretation here. This is way bigger than a hundred tons right there. But at the same time, god damn man, that is... This art very much feels reminiscent of War of the Worlds. And it does show how the Mackie, with that Psychopian initial what looks like an eye even though it's i think the cockpit is kind of terrifying even if it does has dual dick lasers still question whoever designed that not in universe i mean outside of universe as an actual thing for battle tech what were you thinking man and what were you on you know considering this is probably something from the 80s and 90s i think we know the answer to that Dawn of the Battle Max. No history of go. the Atmosphere would be complete without dedicating special part. attention to one of the most iconic features of the modern battlefield. The rise to prominence of these new war machines had a revolutionary influence on the way battles were fought and on the balance of power between the nations as the haves went up against the have-nots. In 2439, the Terran Hegemony completed work on the first prototype battle mech, an evolution of the technology present in industrial mechs that had become popular by the early 25th century. The first mech design, known as the Mackie, incorporated what was at the time cutting-edge tech and a weapons payload to match even the largest armoured vehicles. Ooh. This 100-ton behemoth made use of a neuro-helmet for its pilot, allowing for intuitive and complete control over all systems at a level that surpassed the efficiency and precision of a traditional multi-crew tank. Colonel Charles Kincaid had the honour of giving the Mackie its first combat trial against a platoon of remote-controlled tanks and made short work of his opponents, ushering in the age of the battle mech. News of these developments spread across the Inner Sphere, and the Hegemony's neighbours took notice. The Hegemony expanded their arsenal, introducing the Kudo and Banshee in short order, and began construction on a number of yeah, assemblies across the, the nation. So weird. One heavily fortified location was built within the mountains Granted. of Hesperus, which was at the time a jointly owned world between the Terrans and the Federation of Sky. No one knew at the time- Wait. That's... It's not- as far in as I expected, but that is significantly farther from the hegemony borders than I was expecting those joint worlds would be. Huh. But this particular facility will become one of the central locations in the next 500 years of history. What? The first recorded combat involving mechs took place during a Kirita raid on Styx in 2443, where a single Oh, so Kirita was raiding the hegemony at the same time. You know, actually, that makes perfect sense. I'm not even surprised. Hegemony Lance took on and destroyed the Draconis Combine invaders. Damn. Every side now began scrambling for blueprints that would allow them to design and build their own battle mech. Various attempts at espionage, trade agreements, bribery and assault were undertaken by the different factions. Despite the best efforts of the Terran Hegemony, the knowledge would eventually disseminate across the Inner Sphere to all of the great houses and periphery nations. The number of different mech designs thus exploded, with every side working to field units of their own. And some doing better than others. Much, much worse on a lot of cases, though. Granted, they already made the Banshee, so the bar is set pretty low. 
36 years after their first combat trial, the first mech versus mech action took place between the Draconis Combine and the Lyran Commonwealth, and from then on, the history yeah, of the Inner Sphere would never be tech. the same again. God, I want there to be a second Battle version of that were designed game. to take advantage of Just two bigger. technological developments. The first was the invention of artificial muscles, known as myomas, by Dr. Gregory Atlas in the mid 24th century. Oh, came later? The tensile strength of myomas was Herculean, far surpassing even the most optimistic predictions of the scientists behind it. The second came shortly after the first mechs took to the field, and that was a new form of lightweight ablative armor consisting of layers of titanium steel alloys, ceramics, and artificial diamonds. At first, this new armor was limited in its construction. Artificial diamonds for armor? I mean, I know they're really hard, but they're also brittle as fuck. If you hit them just right, they shatter. Like, it's, it probably is because whoever thought of this initially was going like, hey, that's a good idea. Like, diamonds are great for cutting because they're hard, but for armor? It would just transfer all the force directly in. Again, it's probably just one of those situations where whoever was writing this, her diamond is hard, and ooh, artificial diamonds. That sounds really super sci-fi! There's a lot of things Battletech gets really hard on its science, and then this is the part that's probably a lot softer than anything else. In the scale of hard to soft science being soft is Star Trek, where it's techno babble, you just kind of roll with it, and it's basically magic. And then there's the hard science, which is things that could actually happen in our lifetime, which oddly enough would count a lot of Asimov when he talked about satellites, because when he wrote about satellites, there weren't any. They were inspired by his writings. So things like that. Construction leading to many early mech designs being box like that. in shape, but later models had greater variety. Early designs were primitive by today's standards. Recognizing the need to maintain their technological edge, the hegemony. The Mackie, first mech, the Cuda, which I don't actually know much about, the Banshee, the Orion, the Archer, the Battle Axe, Hespolis, Griffin, the Amir, com the Commando, is that early in? I mean, okay, it's 20 ish years later, but at the same time, and it's by the Lyrian Commonwealth? And the Yermir, I don't know much about, but. I do and the Wasp is also an early design? Followed by the Griffin, the Shadowhawk, the Crossbow, the Gladiator, the Icarus. A lot of these designs I recognize. I didn't realize they were this old. Wow. Just a 40-year timeline. They had this many designs, and some of them stuck around a long time. The fact that the Banshee is still around, though, man. The Orion, that thing's a tank. That makes perfect sense. Germany refined their work and were able to field more advanced units for some years, sometimes even oh, decades the before came from? their neighbors oh. were able to catch up. They maintained the this tech familiar. advantage in all matters throughout most of the Age of War. Eee, the Warhammer. Mechs nice. offered a number of advantages over conventional armor. As previously mentioned, the natural synergy between mined and bipedal mech could result in increased performance compared to traditional vehicles. This design also gave extra maneuverability and allowed for actions such as rolling, crawling, and even scaling mountainsides, feats that would be- Rolling? I'm sorry. When is a battle mech ever in a position to roll? I mean, some of the smaller mechs are only a little bit above giant pieces of armor rather than actual mechs themselves, but I, I don't think it, I've ever seen anyone in any phrase or franchise or I, I don't anywhere that I can think of any series or even some of the crazy animations on YouTube that are absolutely amazing do a rolling battle mech. It's like barrel roll. But apparently that's actually one of the things they were thinking about. I'm kind of wondering if they ever made basically just a human without the armor just to do a test of how close to the versatility can we get so that its only weapons are literally just things it can pick up? I mean, they have hands. It would be very versatile. At some point, you think someone would make a proto-mech that was literally just a giant exoskeleton you plugged into and used as your own body, like going full G Gundam on it, basically. I, I, I mean, if it's that versatile, sure, why not? It doesn't make sense. It wouldn't be armored enough, and it would be a dumb prototype. But as a proof of concept, I'm kind of surprised we haven't heard about that totally impossible in tracked or wheeled units. Oh. Perhaps one of the largest contributing factors to the prevalence of mech designs during this period was how well they integrated with the pre-established Ares conventions. This way, a small elite team of mech warriors could fight an entire campaign over a planet. 
And the thing is, I think this is probably if they were looking for a reason to make the Aries convention sound a little more plausible, the biggest reason shock and awe factor mechs are big, stompy and cool looking and have a detrimental effect on anything. That's not a mech fighting it where a nuke doesn't have that because at this point, everyone knows about it. So a lot of the shock and awe is literally, Oh, we're already dead, which is kind of hard to deal with if you're already dead. So they don't run away screaming. Plus probably more expensive and at far lesser cost than a full army from previous centuries. This in turn had an unexpected consequence as those pilots became increasingly romanticized by the everyday public to the point where they were viewed as modern day knights in armor. In time, this would develop into a Wari Ralit, a new class of nobility, continuing to change the perception of modern warfare. One aspect of mech design that is often incorrectly perceived is their size. The typical mech is around a dozen meters tall, with the lighter chassis sometimes coming in under 10 and the tallest reaching to around 14 meters. Yep. The misconception that they're taller than this often stems from people who have never actually seen one in the field, or sometimes propaganda, commercial vid tapes, or even video games misrepresenting their size. Because they have the actual delegations. The interstellar nations would quickly settle on a standardized form of organizing their Ooh. mech forces, based on multiples Concept of three for and evolution teams? of earlier Maybe. armored units. The basic building block was the Lance, a quartet of mechs designed to complement each other's abilities, or, as the number of mechs increased, simplify logistics. A trio of Lancers formed a company, and a trio of companies a battalion, often with an additional command lance attached. Three battalions would form a regiment, which would typically have a command team of two Lancers on top, though the size of this unit varied. Command In the lancers? age of oh, war, yeah, larger sense. units than regiments were almost always a mixture of mechs and traditional armor. Though each of the great houses would eventually field great numbers of these new units, there was a brief period in history when a single house was able to acquire the technology early, profit greatly from it, and then employ their new marvels in a crushing invasion of their neighbors in what we now know today as Steiner's Long March. Oh? So, the Ares Convention was all talk and apparently ignored frequently! I am absolutely shocked. I mean, it's a good thing they had all those enforcement mechanisms to make sure people wouldn't just dick around and never find out. Yeah. If it sounds like I'm being a little petty, it's because I'm a petty little bitch. But more importantly, I kind of like that, that little realism of, huh, it's useless and we're just going to use it as propaganda for ourselves, essentially. As the way to say, hey, see, you don't need to worry about us nuking you. We definitely won't do it. Followed by, we definitely just did it. At this time period, if someone didn't mention that they were heavily stockpiling and building up their resources for when someone fucked around, I would be very surprised. If anything, i kind of surprised that battleships and warships hadn't become more prevalent during this time period as opposed to dying down, which is what happened. Is what I would say, except for the mech coming out and making such a big splash because it is just big stompy and loud and hard to ignore and it looks so freaking cool so it literally got the fad factor to more or less accidentally make the aries convention work so i'm going to fully credit that to mechs on the one hand they made current standardized war more normal in battle tech on the other hand they probably could if someone wanted to act as a reason for why the aries convention works in the first place because there was a brand new toy they were all playing with that wasn't nukes because it's easier to use a planet destroyed by bullets and explosives than nukes. Yep. Overall, though, I just really like this, and I can't wait to see what happens next. I need to do more of these. <laughs> All right, getting into the Battletech lore from this time period is so rare to find that I enjoy any little bit. And there's a lot that Sven put into this, so I'm a really big fan. So if you haven't already, there's a link below to the original video. Hit it up. If you like this, subscribe. And if you check out my Discord, there is all of that discussion from one of the artists who did the various flags used in this video. Check that out because their methodology was really cool. I already talked about it, but it's begs repeating. Or, well, bears repeating. Let's go with that. Yeah. I'll see you guys in the next one. Adios.